So I'll let, let me give a little bit of an overview about what I want to talk about uh, tonight. Um, I kind of want to talk about yeah this payment federation problem that each payment system uh, in the world has today. It's it's uh, um, there, there's really no way for payments to interoperate with each other. And I'll explain a little bit about how Stellar uh, solves this problem technically. Um, and forgive me if this, this talk is not as complex or technical as uh, you guys expected. Um, but uh, please reserve your technical questions like you know for the end and, and feel free to like make them as hard as, as you want. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll go through this and then uh, I'll give an example like um, Michael mentioned. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about how Stellar uh, and Bitcoin, how Stellar can uh, complement Bitcoin and, and some ideas there. Um, so with that, let's just get started. So meet Alice and Bob. They're gonna be our volunteers uh, tonight. And they wanna send each other money. And how does that happen? Alice wants to send Bob money. Well, she could use cash. And cash is great, cash is easy. People know how to use cash, but it kind of sucks once it's uh, when she's talking about international uh, tr transactions or, or even just far away, being far away from somebody. So how about PayPal? Well, PayPal said, hey, Alice, hey, Bob, just give us your fiat currency, give us your cash, you know, and we'll, uh, we'll make a balance for you internally in our, in our system. And you can send anybody that cash, uh, in any currency, to anybody else in the PayPal, ne in the PayPal network. And, and that's great. You know, we'll take care of the currency conversion for you. We'll take care of, of all of it for you in getting it into your bank accounts. And it works. Like, it does work to send cash from Alice to Bob, except that Alice and Bob may not be in the same network. They might not both be on PayPal. So maybe they're using something else like Square Cash, or maybe they're using Google Wallet, or maybe they're using Bitcoin, and maybe Bob doesn't actually want to be a part of PayPal because he doesn't trust PayPal. And so if they're not on the same network, this transaction is not going to work. We have an oper interoperability problem between every single payment system in, in the world right now, from PayPal to Google Wallet, to Bitcoin, to M-Pesa, none of them can talk to each other. I can't be using, use my Bitcoin balance to send US dollars to somebody with PayPal, and that sucks. Wait, but that's, that's for a reason, right? Is it? <laughs> Is it not? <laughs> well, maybe we just tell everybody to use one system. How about PayPal? Let's take PayPal, for instance. Let's everybody use PayPal, you know? It just works. Uh, you know, how hard is it, Bob? Just get five minutes, get a PayPal account. Well, yeah, it's hard if you live in these countries where PayPal doesn't support, or Google Wallet doesn't support, or Venmo doesn't support, or the card networks don't support because of international sanctions, and maybe Western democracies telling them not to. And it's pretty hard if you don't have a bank account because most payment systems require you have a bank account in order to be on the network. Fortunately, a new payment system was created recently that lets anybody join and send money to anybody in the world, no matter what country they're affiliated with or their bank account, and it's called Bitcoin. And Bitcoin allows anybody to send anybody else Bitcoin in the world. They can transact using Bitcoin. I can send somebody Bitcoin, as long as they have a Bitcoin address, and, or an agent, and they can exchange, just converting Bitcoin to the cash that they want to see. So Bitcoin still suffers from this in-network problem. I can't use Bitcoin to send somebody US dollars in PayPal. And Bitcoin has another problem that's particularly suited for the underbanked, or particularly problematic for the underbanked, which is the currency volatility. So Bitcoin has a currency that's, that's extremely volatile. And if you're living on $2 a day or less, and somebody sends you just $10 worth of Bitcoin, and that even just goes down 5%. I mean, that's, you're talking about a half a day of wages right there lost. And that's a risk that most people aren't willing to take that live on this kind of money. So what do we need? We need transactions and local currency. We need people to choose the system that they want to use and not be forced into one system or one currency. And we want them to be able to use what they are comfortable with using. We need a federated protocol between these different systems of choice to enable a interconnected, interoperable uh, payment system. And we need it to be decentralized, and we need it to have open access, no matter what country you're from or what your bank account looks like. And this is where Stellar comes in. Stellar is a decentralized global payment network that allows the interoperability between these various payment systems. And how does it do that? Well, I'd like to go through and talk about each one of these um, from a technical perspective. So we'll start with the globally distributed database that Stellar has at its heart um, called the Ledger. And we'll talk about how these payment systems can leverage the Ledger uh, to credit their customers' deposits um, in Stellar accounts. And then we'll talk about the distributed exchange that's built into the Ledger that allows the accounts to exchange currencies between one another. And then we'll round it off with the real world example that I was talking about earlier. 
So this globally distributed open database, what is it? Well, it, this, this basically, this is a distributed database that holds accounts, and accounts hold balances and other properties associated with these accounts. And each server on the network is running a local copy of this database, which is called the ledger, and using open source software and a protocol to communicate with other servers on the network. Each of these servers is called a Stellar node. Um, stellar nodes are constantly sending around changes that they see to the network, to each other. Uh, for instance, I mean, so, so nodes are sending transactions, which are changes to the network are called transactions, and nodes are sending them around and receiving them, and then updating their local copy to the ledger through a process called consensus, which unfortunately is out of scope for this talk, but feel free to like save your consensus questions for the end, because I know you have a bunch of them, because it's a very hard problem. <laughs> So what are accounts? Well, accounts, they store balances, and these payment systems can use, like I've mentioned, these payment systems can use accounts to store the credit, to store the deposits that their customers are giving them. So when Alice gives PayPal $100, PayPal can use, uh, can store that balance instead of in an internal database, internally to PayPal, they can credit Alice's account on the network. But before they can do that, Alice's Stellar account needs to explicitly set a trust line to explicitly grant permission to PayPal's Stellar account to be able to credit it, and that's called a trust line. So let's put it together a little bit from our example before. So we have both Alice and Bob sending, sending fiat currency to PayPal and Square Cash. And in this example, in the hypothetical example, PayPal and Square Cash have both integrated with Stellar as what we call gateways. And gateways simply take an external deposit and then credit that deposit's balance inside of a Stellar account instead of their own. So now both Stellar and, or both Alice and Bob have balances uh, with Square Cash and PayPal on the network, Stellar network. Um, and how and, and so if if so Alice can now send her balance instead of through PayPal she can send it through Stellar to anybody else that also um, has a trust line to PayPal's account and how does that work before we can talk about how this 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 transfer of balance actually works we need to kind of talk about what an account is um, an account on the Stellar network is simply a uh, row in the ledger that has a balance and some properties associated with it, and it's addressed by a public key of a public-private key pair. The private half of the public key, uh, of the key pair is what's, what, what you use to authorize changes to your account. Um, and uh, we use the digital signature scheme, ED25519, um, for, for those digital signatures authorizing changes. Um, so I mentioned a trust line. Well, one of the properties on an account is a trust line. And, um, the account also has associated balances, like the 100 USD that PayPal gave Alice. And one, one big difference between Bitcoin and Stellar is that Bitcoin, or in Stellar, there's no output transactions. There's no new, new address for every single transaction you want to make. It's one account. It's one address per user. Of course, the user can have multiple addresses, but multiple accounts. But this is kind of the model that we've taken in Stellar. And a Stellar transaction is what is actually used to change the account, what, actually, what, what Alice will actually create when she wants to send her balance. So a transaction in Stellar is a set of operations on, an, on accounts or multiple, on one account or multiple accounts. And there's different types of operations. So there's a, there's a payment operation, which is <coughs> a uh, instruction to take a, take a balance in the source account and send it to another account. There's also a trust set operation, which is what Alice used when she authorized PayPal to give her credit. Transactions um, are propagated throughout the network and are applied to, to the ledger. And we call being applied to the ledger what changes the account, which moves the ledger from one state to another state. Um, like I mentioned before, transactions must include digital signatures uh, for each signing key that's associated with the account. There's another operation, um, there's another transaction operation called add signing key, which allows an account to add multiple keys that need to be used to uh, sign um, an operation on the account, um, effectively making a, a multi-sig um, Stellar account. It's a very easy operation. Um, transactions are used, are created using client software, and you're all familiar with client software. It's just a Bitcoin wallet, for instance, is an implementation of client software in Bitcoin. Uh, it, lets, it lets humans, using an API, it lets humans and other programs easily create transactions and interact with the Stellar network. Um, and most importantly, it manages the secret key, signing uh, these transactions with the user's secret key. So here's a little bit of overview of the architecture as I mentioned it so far. Users interacting with the gateway client software on desktop or mobile and creating a transaction, which is being forwarded to that 
to Gateway's client software, or that client software's trusted node. The trusted node then forwards it off to the rest of the network where it's applied. And this operation happens on average about five in about five seconds. So putting it all together, Alice is now able to send any other Stellar account her PayPal USD balance. But that's great, but you know, it's not anything different than what we've seen so far. I mean, even if PayPal's not inter integrated with Stellar, they could be doing this exact operation internally. Um, what we wanted was an open network. What we wanted was interconnectivity between PayPal and Square Cash. What we wanted was for people to use their own local currencies to send somebody it may be a different currency. And that's where the distributed exchange comes in. There's a built-in foreign currency exchange inside of the Stellar Protocol. And this allows accounts to create orders to buy and sell currency pairs directly in the protocol using an offer create transaction type. Trading client software enables users um, of the exchange to see the order books, uh, the various order books out there to create offers to see their trading history just like you would experience in a Bitcoin exchange. But it also enables something really awesome, which is a payment path. And the payment path is essentially what lets me holding, or Alice holding USD, send Bob holding, uh, send Bob euros through an offer on the distributed exchange. And so just to kind of like bring that to an example, we have Alice, we have Bob, and we've, been third, we've included a third party here called Trader, who has a trust line with both PayPal and Square Cash. The Trader goes ahead and creates an offer on the network to buy 100 USD from PayPal and sell 100 euro. That creates a path between Alice's dollars in PayPal. Oh, I mixed those up, sorry about that. Alice's dollars in PayPal and Bob's euros in Square Cash. And using an augmented client software that actually can query the network for available paths. Uh, this is an example from our official uh, Stellar client software, for instance. Alice can say, I want to send to Bob and I want to send 20 euro. And it will come back with currency uh, options to say, Alice, you can send using this currency or this currency, and she'll choose to send using her USD balance. And it will go through the offer that the trader has put up. And it will all happen in an atomic transaction all at one time in about five seconds. And this will be the result of it. It will be Alice has given 20 USD to the trader, and the trader has gone and given 20 USD or 20 euro to Bob. How many of those traders do you guys have? Uh, sorry. What's that? What would you say? Uh, how many traders do you have in the network right now? How many traders do we have in the network right now? Well, our net... <clears throat> this is what we've seen so far. We've seen a gateway credit a deposit uh, on a Stellar network instead of its own. We've seen how the distributed exchange enables this federation between different gateways so that I can use my PayPal balance or asking for PayPal balance to send somebody else different currency from a different system. And we've seen people transact, and we've seen Alice and Bob transacting their local currencies, which they're comfortable with. So now I'd like to talk about the real world example that I alluded to earlier, which is the Perquet Foundation. The Perquet Foundation is a nonprofit organization in South Africa that's created a platform called Vumi. Vumi enables application developers to build applications um, that reach users of feature phones in Africa. Feature phones are the ones before smartphones that don't have data connection, but they do have a SIM card. And Vumi allows you to reach those users using a USSD se uh, session. What, what Perquet has done is integrated Stellar into Vumi, now enabling anybody with an application to include Stellar automatically. And one of the first applications built on Vumi that's going to be using Stellar is Girl Effect. And a side note about Girl Effect, Girl Effect is an application that incentivizes and educates young girls in Ethiopia, Rwanda, and Nigeria to save uh, money and incentivizes them. They've, what they've done is they've incentivized them using airtime. And now airtime is how you buy minutes in Africa and uh, on your cell network. And so when a girl completes a milestone or completes a survey, they'll send them some airtime. And they can use that to buy minutes. Now with Stellar, each girl, each user of this application will get a Stellar wallet. And instead of sending them airtime directly, what they'll do is they'll send them an airtime credit for the particular airtime uh, type that they're, um, they're cell network uses. So for instance, in Rwanda, it would, be, it would be Airtel. And they would send them a credit on the Stellar and their Stellar wallet, like ATL, right? And now the girls can look and say, oh, I have 10 ATL. And they can use that as minutes. They can buy minutes. Or they can send the, that, the, that, um, that airtime credit 
to somebody else with the Girl Effect application. And the great thing is, is that they can send it to somebody else in the Girl Effect application that doesn't actually use Airtel. They can send it to their friends in Ethiopia that's using Ethiopian telco, right? And it will be converted instantly through the distributed exchange. So for the first time ever, these girls and, and users of these applications are able to send their uh, airtime to, peop to, to uh, users of different um, cell networks. And it's never been able to happen before. And this is how Procad is solving the interoperability problem there. And so that's what Stellar is all about. It's all about, it's a federated infrastructure for payments. And this way it's not intended to be user facing. It's intended to bring these, dis these disparate payment networks together, um, including Bitcoin. And like its predecessors before it, TCP becoming the, uh, enabling the world's first global network, SMTP enabling the first email transfer between two ISPs, Stellar attempts to be this for payments. Stellar's mission is to become this for payments, a public infrastructure for connecting payment systems together with open app access. That's One second, I'm almost done. This is the last slide, sorry. Well, um, this is, okay. All right. Tell me a little bit about that's a really interesting um, story, the Phuket story. Um, mm -hmm. What is the penetration in and the impact overall on the community? So they're, they're still in development. So they're, they're actually actively developing. We, we announced this partnership in, um, it was about February, I think. Got it, got it. Yeah, so it is just. just aspiring to, I mean, you talked about some of the potential that, but, you know, is it mainly the incentivization for the kids or, you know, the girls or? Um, so or the girl effect application itself is um, to kind of, uh, in, in educate girls on how to save in a, in a world that doesn't actually um, think that girls should be actually holding any money at all, right. that, that maybe feel that like it's the man's job to have the money, right. when the man will actually normally, and studies have been done, go out and maybe not spend it on the best things for the family. And so it's kind of like trying to, to, to bring a social change in that regard. And um, by using Stellar, right, like, not only does it like enable them to send that airtime, which is actually used as a currency in these countries amongst other people, not in just even in the same network, but it also enables now somebody uh, using an application in the United States, for instance, using a Bitcoin wallet that's integrated with Stellar to send these girls minutes using the Bitcoin in their Bitcoin wallet, never holding a minute, but being able to like instantly exchange. Like that's kind of the vision that's, that, that cool. they're moving forward. And so to end it out, I would just like to kind of throw out some ideas there uh, about how can an existing Bitcoin company benefit from integration with Stellar. Um, we've kind of mentioned just one with Tariq, like, you know, it would, um, anybody can send these girls, well, once it's online, anybody can send these girls um, minutes uh, if their Bitcoin wallet is, um, uh, is integrated with Stellar. Um, and that's kind of like one of the, the first ones is if you run Bitcoin payment software, uh, it's only beneficial to, to integrate with a system that lets that software be used not just to send Bitcoin to other Bitcoin holders, but Bitcoin to anybody or receive Bitcoin from any other source. Um, exchanges that are building this world-class exchange software benefit because now those exchanges can trade fiat as well as not just Bitcoin. And um, they, they, the exchanges benefit from increased liquidity if they're building on top of a distributed exchange, not just relying on the liquidity within their walled garden. Um, and that's it. That's all I have. So thanks, you guys, for listening. And uh, I'll take questions now. Yeah. Um, you said the transactions were on the ledger. That was on a really huge scale of the It was definitely. I didn't go into sort of consensus for a few reasons, but I'll try to answer that question. So when I say transactions are applied to the ledger, What's actually happening when these nodes are forwarding transactions to the rest of the network is each of these servers, each of these nodes, they're keeping a tally of all the transactions they've seen. And, and at a certain time, all the nodes will come to consensus on a specific set of transactions to apply to their local copy of the ledger. And that consensus mechanism is sort of the secret sauce behind how Stellar is actually keeping all of the ledgers in sync. And um, soon we'll be releasing a consensus white paper that describes our new consensus algorithm um, in detail, and that's going to be released here in the coming weeks. Um, but, but currently, that's, that's kind of the, at the high level. That's what's happening, is each, each, each server is, is using a consensus algorithm to come to an agreement on a specific set of transactions to apply to the ledger.
So is it, is it just uh, it hasn't been you know described effectively? Is it's like is it it's open source? Um, right, so currently we have a consensus algorithm that we're using in our old system, but we're moving towards a new consensus algorithm that's, that's yet to be released yet. It will be released open source, and our implementation of it will also be open source, and that's happening very soon, like in the coming weeks. I have a quick question about um, the, the social good story. Um, I've been guessing this is one of many other you know, community impact stories that is unique to Stellar that we may not care about Bitcoin. What has been the response of like governments and local sort of like, you know, organizations that control fiat and control wealth, seeing, you know, this type of new entrant, you know, a new sort of bubbling, you know, um, stuff happening from a social good point of view. Have, you know, do governments say, this is great, we want to participate? Are they, you know, more defensive? Are they just ignoring seller? I mean, it's very unique what you're doing, so I'm kind of curious how that affects governmental organizations that want to control movement of funds. So being able to represent a deposit on Stellar, um, for instance, like with PayPal, um, like that's definitely going to fall under like governmental jurisdiction, being able to like be a money transmitter, for instance, in the United States, and th those laws still apply. Um, so the idea behind Stellar is like, yes, there are going to be times when um, governments will have a say in what you're doing, but that's up to the local jurisdictions, for instance. So where PayPal may not reach those countries that I mentioned, there may be a payment system in those countries that, um, that does comply with those countries' laws, right? And the idea is that that payment system, uh, with its local jurisdiction, it knows its regulations, it knows its local, its local laws uh, for finance, and it can, it can take care of that regulation and then plug into sort of like a bigger ecosystem and still be interoperable with other payment systems. Um, yeah, Joyce may be actually able to answer a little bit more. Yeah, and it's not just the one who's uh, interfacing with the, the folks in and around government. What we've seen is that governmental response to digital currencies varies a lot by um, what that country's needs are. And we are dealing with a lot of the projects that we see, like Craig Health, are in communities where healthcare, education, literacy are big, big, top of the line problems for governments. So they are looking for ways to make their financial system more efficient, not because it's a convenience issue, but because it's a human rights issue. Right? Mm. Um, so what we see, for example, is in a lot of countries that are in emerging markets, um, aid money is a large source of, of GDP, and a significant amount of aid money is lost in transit as it's getting to where it's supposed to go. And we all know that digital currencies do a great job of kind of stopping that loss. Um, another thing that is interesting is that in a lot of these countries, G2 uh, P payments, government to person payments, account for a large part of a household income. What that means is that when the family and the government gives a rice subsidy or a little subsidy so that people won't starve, and then a significant amount of that money is also lost when being transmitted from the government to the people in the villages. So they're looking for ways to minimize that. Um, another interesting use case that has come to us that was brought to us by some major foundations is refugee camps. They are pop-up deployments that last for several months, where they have to give out food rations and, and healthcare rations to everybody that's there. And they want an efficient, trackable, reasonable way that cannot be stolen from a person who's right? And that's obviously something that these, these, these protocols can all do a good job of. So it's something that we're seeing a lot more of the mindedness to. Um, and I think that those are all great use cases. And, and do the governments then want to run nodes themselves? Do they participate in the ecosystem that way? Or? I would say that most that space that are asking questions right now are still in the learning phase. Mm -hmm. And I would expect that they would be in the learning phase for a long time. Because remember, President Obama was the first American president that had his own cell phone. Right? Like, and that's here. So so governments have a lot to catch up on. Um, but we are seeing very interesting and disparate groups of people wanting to learn notes. Louder. I'm very interested about what type of organizations you allow to issue, um, like, I guess, currency. I understand how you can trade your dollars in real money and some like dollars to fair time credit in Africa. Is there any kind of um, regulation around how much fair time credit they can sell? And how do you decide if someone is able to do that? So, this kind of goes back to that, that, uh, that 
sort of philosophy of what we wanted was we wanted to decentralize control over the network and, and we wanted it to be open where anybody can join the network and participate. Um, and and, and that, in that regard, when you say, do we allow, there's actually no we allowing it. This is public infrastructure. It's owned by everybody. It's owned by nobody. Um, and anybody can join the network. They can spin up a node. They can start sending transactions. They can create an account. When it comes to actual governmental regulations, though, like I mentioned, Tariq, it comes down to the fact that, yes, there are restrictions in these various countries that are, you know, for uh, how much maybe currency you can issue, or, or even if you can issue currency on the Stellar Network. And that's up to organizations in those countries to comply with their local laws. It's, it's, does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, so, Paul, on that, have you had any Um, I don't know about local currency is in, in like that, but there I can mention a, uh, a really novel idea that I'm super jazzed about called Reveal. And Reveal is a social network that's actually been built organically around Stellar. Um, so, um, so what Reveal does is it's a social network. Anybody who joins Reveal, it's just like a, any other social network that you can share content. And one, a user on Reveal who shares content, um, if that content gets uh, promoted or liked um, or it gains a lot of attention, the Reveal network will pay that user in Reveal coins on Stellar. So each user in Reveal is getting a Stellar account and as, as they uh, get more likes for their content, they're getting paid out in Reveal uh, coin. It's just a credit on the network. And um, someday uh, uh, Josh Beal, who's, who's the founder of Reveal coin, he's, he's uh, planning on um, adding advertisements to the social network and the only way to pay for those advertisements will be using Reveal Coin. So now they're actually giving their users a stake in the, uh, the growth of the network, um, which is kind of a really cool novel idea that's never actually been done before, um, which I'm pretty excited about. Thank you. Yeah. So how are assets like the minutes that you mentioned uh, created on the Stellar network? Okay, right. So a user has a Stellar account. In, in the case of the minutes um, with Girl Effect, a uh, user of the application will get a Stellar account. And um, the um, Girl Effect application itself, Perquette Foundation, also has a Stellar account. And every single one of their users' Stellar accounts will automatically create a trust line to the Perquette Foundation Stellar account. And then when the Perquette Foundation wants to send that Girl Stellar account minutes, it will just create a payment transaction that sends that girl's seller account uh, airtime minutes, like 10 airtime minutes, for instance. And it's just a transaction. It's like, it's like they are just updating that, that user's balance, basically, because so that, that user allowed them to credit their balance for a particular. So in the case of airtime minutes, there's not like a limited supply. It's just the, the organization saying, here's 10. Right. Here's 10. And then they have, there's something else that lets them cash that in for actual minutes. Exactly. Okay. So in the case of, in this very simplified case of PayPal, for instance, I mean, this is a case where they're just, they're issuing the, the airtime and they can redeem it for the actual airtime minutes themselves. But in PayPal's case, like, user gives $100 to PayPal, PayPal issues $100 credit to that user's Stellar account. And at some point in time, whether it's that user or whether that user sends it to somebody else, somebody will be able to go back with that credit and say, hey, I have credit issued from you Where's the actual like underlying asset? And that's how you represent fiat currency and other ass external assets on the network in Stellar. Yeah. Is there any notion of default within the Stellar network? So for example, if I you know, issue some kind of token, whether it's minutes or I say, yeah, I have $100 and I'll give it to you, is there a way other nodes who may previously have had trust lines to me can say, hey, no, this guy is not good for his 100 air time minutes. He said he issued them, but there's no actual minutes there. Because I, I, is there, so can you, is there some kind of like default, this guy's in default flag, or can you sort of revoke a trust line and publicly? You kind of publicly shame an account and issue Yeah. I mean, right. Is there anything like that, or is that not really? Uh, no, there's no. Uh, is there like, do you, do you sort of just look at people's sort of the degree of their graph and try to figure out it that way, or like how is reputation? Okay, you can make so, a site for it. What? You can make a site for it. Yelp, some reputation. 
Consensus that I didn't mention, which for various reasons, uh, is nodes in the network actually choose who they want to listen to, right? And so a node, for instance, with a lot of inbound connections, like a lot of people listening to it, for instance, may be trusted more than other nodes that aren't. And if that node represents some bank, for instance, that's one that's one aspect of trust that you can you can rely on that's built inside of the network kind of implicitly. Yeah. If I'm writing one of these applications from the Fed Health Foundation. And someone someone sent me someone sent me minutes. Uh, out, out, and then I would like to send it to somebody's head outlet, for instance, or yep. some other system on this that also supports this that network. Yep. How does that process work? Right. So um, you can memorize their address. That's one way of doing it, because assuming you know PayPal will give them or their account has a, an address that you can type in. And I'm assuming that that's like not reasonable for like 99.9% .9 of the population. So there's another, uh, there's an external protocol to Stellar. It's not built into the core protocol, but it's called uh, a federation protocol. And what that allows, it's, it's, it's a protocol that, um, it's very simple. Basically, it allows you to map um, uh, email style uh, domain names or email style uh, addressing to a Stellar address. So you're a, a user of an application that has, you have a Stellar wallet and you want to send maybe a user, of pay, Bob, at PayPal, right? So using a federation protocol, P PayPal can set up a, uh, uh, what's called a Stellar TXT file at their domain. And then your client software that you're using to send, when you say Bob at PayPal.com, what the client software can do is, is take the domain PayPal, look up PayPal.com slash Stellar.txt, and then that will return a endpoint that they can hit with Bob um, that will return Bob's Stellar address to you. Does that, that kind of make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. And that, but that's, um, does PayPal have to trust the PayPal Foundation? How, how does that, that line of trust work? Or, or what if the PayPal Foundation is issuing minutes to, to too many people and they're all sending it to a PayPal wallet and cashing out? How, how does that trust work? Right, so that would be sort of, you know, the job of people that are actually on the exchange that are saying, I'm actually willing to pay 10 PayPal US dollars for minutes, right? And those, those people would be the ones that are actually giving the, the dollars. It wouldn't be PayPal trusting. It would be the users of PayPal trusting that are, that are creating offers on the exchange to make that exchange happen. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, I just want to clarify, yeah, PayPal definitely doesn't have to have any relation with PayPal at all. Right. Yeah, they yeah. exist, it's just, there's just people in the middle of offering just a market-driven thing between the PayPal dollars and the PayPal dollars. So, I mean, there's a each of those credits exchange. Yeah. 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 Um, so, for the assets when you turn it, is it, is it like associated, like, what's the differentiator between, like, the minutes from the organization and, like, PayPal US dollars? Right. So, right. So in the accounts entry in the ledger, there's going to be various balances. So one balance will be US dollars issued by uh, PayPal. And it, it wouldn't say PayPal, it would be PayPal's stellar address, what we call the issuing address. Um, but it would be USD for issuing address. And then minutes, like say it was, if it was Airtel, minutes, ATL, issued by Perquette Foundation's stellar address. Maybe there would be another USD address down there issued by some other issuer if they had multiple USD issuers. But that's how you represent the balance, is it's a currency issuer pair. Yeah. All right, well. Uh, next year, it's uh, March 31st. What does that look like? Uh, well, Vumi is integrated by then, so we've got at least one. <laughs> we've got at least one uh, awesome use case that's actually affecting like real people. I mean, people use airtime as currency in these countries, and right now they can't send them cross-border. 
And I mean, families move, you know, people move across borders and like, why can't I send, my, you know, my family airtime to top of their, top of their mobile phone, right? I'm on a different network. Well, at least that, that problem is solved for them. Yeah, can you talk about, um, so I see that when I look at the site, there's these you know, assets that are stellar. Yep. And then how are they really, like, do I need those in order to go on and create my assets and then let people trade them, or how are they relate to the whole system? So Stellars are uh, a little different. I didn't mention them in this talk, but Stellars are the digital, are the, are the native currency in Stellar. Um, they're not issued by anybody. So nobody can actually issue uh, a currency with the STR abbreviation. Those are reserved. Um, and Stellars are, are uh, the, uh, the way that you actually pay for a account, pay for an account. Each account, when, it's, when an account is created, 20 stellars need to be sent to uh, that account's address, and that's a minimum reserve. And then each transaction actually takes a bit of stellars um, away from the balance of the source account. And it's a fraction of a stellar. It's, it's um, about 10 micro stellars, and there's a million micro stellars in one stellar. And so that's about 100,000 transactions for one stellar, and one stellar is worth less than a penny. Um, but anyway, this is, a, this is a mechanism to reduce kind of like spam in the network. Um, and, and then the reserve balance for each account is, is to reduce ledger bloat. Um, and these sellers, they come from <clears throat> the original account, the inception. And this is a term that people like to use. It's called pre-mined. Well, this is not really mining, but I mean, when the, when the ledger started, there was one account in the ledger, and it was the root account. And that account had a balance of 100 billion stellars. And then the then consensus started, and no more, no more stellars were able to be created, um, with a few caveats. But um, every account was created from that root account by that root account funding it with over 20 stellars. I mean, this is awesome. By the way, connecting is the protocol, the stewardship, and the nonprofit piece, so people can get on board without you know asymmetric benefiting benefiting other people they don't like. The, the, the one thing I wonder, and I kind of always had this question, was other than the anti-spam feature, which makes sense. Could, other than what? Other than the, sorry, other than the anti-spam feature, yeah. which makes sense, couldn't you do all of this without having any seller? Like without seller existing? Sure. No, not, the, not the company. Right. The, 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 the native currency itself. It's not a peg, right? It's, you have the exchangers for that. So you don't need a peg. Right. Which is cool. Right. But, but, the, but the, you, you could, but the anti-spam thing is really important. Otherwise, it doesn't work. So. Right. So if you had some other mechanism for anti-spam, then it's quite possible you could make a slightly, uh, maybe even be much more scalable system because it didn't depend on this piece. Uh, I mean, I'm hearing people forking Ripple without the XRPs as new projects. Yeah. But like, I think the thing, things like that, and it's, other than the spam thing. But it doesn't impact the scalability of it. Like it's equally scalable, whether their coins are there or not there. So does it take away from Stellars if there are no Stellars? <clears throat> but can Stellar be burned? When destroyed? Destroyed. It's destroyed as part of the anti-spam. Yeah. Uh, another function that it serves is as a potential medium of exchange between what's known as exotic currency pairs. Right, right, OK. okay. No, no. Like, no, no. If, like if I have like Thai bot and I want to send something like Brazilian Riyadh, yep. there's probably not a good exchange between them. So you would go into Stellar's and then back out to Stellar's. It's like it becomes like this. When you're from you know. smaller countries that have not high liquidity currency trade, um, going into another small currency, a small country currency, is often to, to use a non-technical analogy, it's like taking a four-layer overflight, right? So okay. what Stellar does it allows it to collapse. There's no exchanger one. that came forward to bear. To bear the risk there, so you can use it this way. Right, it's a, it's a common one. I mean, no, there's no, no one has, there's not a particular counterpart, so everyone can trust it. So then, like otherwise, like the number, of, like issuers is like, you know, order n squared. If you don't have sellers, it's order n. If you do have sellers, so that makes it way more scalable. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. The only other question there is if this happens relatively often, and you have a hundred billion of them, and they get burned in the process, isn't there an number limit? They, they just think they're all gone, you mean? I mean, at some point. Like, so we have inflation. You mean because for the transaction fee? Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's. That's well, a good problem. There, there is inflation, but then also, like, it would, I mean, it's just infeasible that that many transactions would happen. So, 
Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's a good problem to have. Yeah. So sort of, okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, it's like 10 microstellars and there's 100 billion, so I don't know if you do it, but it's more. You have to make transactions for like, um, like 50,000 years or something, like constantly. So. That's a long time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I got the plan. It's a long time. It's 50,000 years. If you go for 50,000 years, yeah. good luck. So, are they um, foundation? Almost um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, but the foundation the, the foundation has two purposes: one to give away most of the stellars, and then to, and the other to like maintain the, the core protocol. So we, we, basically, the foundation is giving it away currently. And so you're funding also your development through the uh, Yeah, we have five percent reserved for the operations of the, the foundation. Ninety-five percent. Uh, for, for that question over here. Oh, sorry, the call. And it's an aside. But for, for the, the core currency, you said it's easier if everybody goes into one currency or out of another currency. Isn't it possible to use something like Bitcoin, which is already widely accepted? Uh, sure, but it needs to be the coin issued by a particular person. So it would have to be, you know, like bit set Bitcoin or something like that. And then people have to agree on what issuer. So it's just, it's complicated. So, I mean, I don't know what will happen, but, but it's the, the options that. Uh, I guess, what is the benefit to a system like this as opposed to a system where your currency is going to be issued on the blockchain? Oh, you mean like the main point, for instance? It's one of the possibilities. Um, something made quite similar, but more you know, blockchain based. Um, I think there's something like Tether, which you can issue. Sure. Um, sure, sure. Yeah, um, that's a good question. You know, I think um, in a lot of ways, uh, consensus mechanism that Stellar uses um, may be better suited for um, a federated protocol that doesn't necessarily rely on um, mining. Um, when you talk about mining, you're talking about you're really talking about people that are uh, maintain the the blockchain through monetary incentive. And when you're talking about a federated protocol. Um, where anybody can kind of join in and, and become a node, um, you're, you're not really talking about a consistent algorithm that's, that's using monetary uh, incentives not to defraud the network, right? Um, we, you want something a little bit more uh, assured uh, to come to consensus rather than, than uh, more of a game theoretical aspect of, of consensus. And I might not be explaining this completely uh, well, but um, I would say April 27th is the day that, that they're giving the, the talk on, uh, on the consistency algorithm that Stellar uses. And he's going to address a lot of these, these uh, questions um, regarding, like, why not blockchain? Why not mining? You know, what's, what's better about Stellar consensus protocol? And uh, so that's a lot of those questions will be answered at that time. Sorry, I don't have more. <laughs> Tonight, but it's not released yet. It's not my consensus protocol, so I think it'd be a little presumptuous to talk about it. Have you guys seen anybody fork Stellar? I don't, I don't think so. Not yet. Yeah. The new stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Is that it? Come on, we have nothing else for Andrew. There you go. Yeah, that's right. really, I think, but, but how do you get, so I said it for then how do you get that initial like 20 sellers that you assign to capture to create a gateway? Right. Okay, so the initial 20 sellers. Uh, so like Jen mentioned, uh, those 100 million sellers were under the control of foundation. And there's several mandates actually like, disperse those sellers among the stuff of the world right? And so one of those ways is uh, a big, uh, seller giveaway um, that, uh, you sign up on launch.star.org and you, use, uh, you can authenticate using Facebook as a verification mechanism of identity and then you can be paid out 20 sellers automatically. Um, for this particular meetup though, um, we have a invite code that, that anybody here can, can get. Um, just email Eva and she'll send you a code um, that will fund you uh, a seller account for about 100 sellers I think. Uh, and you can kind of get started. Um, yeah, so yeah, eva.stellar.org is the email there. I have a question for Jed and Joyce. So you guys have seen Bitcoin ecosystem. You are my favorite at Bitcoin 
developer meetup organizer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, the endorphins. <laughs> so you guys have seen this ecosystem for years now, right? Um, you know, for a long time. Well, to work. And, and, you know, assuming that you can, you know, uh, take a 40,000 foot view above this ecosystem with a non-biased approach, um, even though that, you know, you have your personal preference, um, what is your view of, you know, where cryptocurrencies have come so far? Um, you know, basically to where we are right now, I mean, and again, Bitcoin is at 248, so it's in the dumps. Um, you know, it's not, the view four years over, um, but you guys have seen a lot. Is there anything that you guys can tell us that maybe you've seen, given your history in this space, that for us who maybe haven't been here as long, that you know, we might want to take note of, or any patterns, anything that would be interesting for us devs to consider? I mean, I have a couple of things to say on that. One, um, I actually would like to say that, you said that you know, even though we're biased, I would actually like to say that we are, well, I, I'll, I'll speak for myself, is that my number one goal in all of this, and if, if you look back at my work with human rights work and civil rights work, is, is to figure out how can we use technology to really bring into the fold people that have been left out for no apparent reason at all. Right? And to be honest, I will back any technological stack that can accomplish that. So at the moment, I believe that Stellar is designed with specifically as many people in the world as possible in mind. Um, but I will always give my honest answer as to what I think is, is good for, for everybody. Um, in terms of what I see over the course of the morning, one of the things I would actually really love to challenge everybody in this room to do, Bitcoin devs, all of you guys and gals are a unique breed of devs, right? Like you, you have picked an area that is one of the hardest areas to build a company in, to launch things in because of the regulatory frameworks that we have to deal with because people are so attached to how they do their money. But it really is one of the most important things that we can change, but we need to change it beyond our geographic area here. We have to change it beyond Europe. We have to change it beyond where credit cards work. Where we, we, we think about the prompts banks have from the position of somebody who's banked, right? But step out of that role for a bit and realize that most of the world is not in our shoes. So what can we build that actually gets all of those folks on a more efficient transportation system for money that will not be about, you know, how do I pay somebody faster than square cash, but how do I like actually pay for putting a, you know, a child through school, how do I pay for a small healthcare cost? You know, there's all these crazy facts that we've learned as we've done this research. And some of the small ones, you know, we, we talk a lot about this $2 a day, but you know, what does that really mean? We see studies where you know, the average family uses 14 different kinds of financial services in Kenya, and for, according to one of these financial lottery studies, 14 different financial services. So they're not underutilizing their money. They're doing their damnedest to make sure that their money works for them and the tools they have are good enough. So what tools can we build that can actually start moving that forward? Right? So that's actually something that I actually do want us here to think about day in and day out. Um, and then what you'll see from that is businesses grow faster when people really need what you're building. They always say, you know, I used to be BC, we always say that you always want to, um, what is it, you want to invest in medicine and not candy? Or something along those lines? You want to invest in something people need, not something people like to have. Right? And, and, and that's what you're about. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's basically, it's, we're still like super early days. And um, I think it's clear to everyone that one of these kind of systems, like some cryptocurrency universal payment network needs to exist because money doesn't work like the internet does and it, it should. Um, so it's just a matter of time before it happens. It's just, and I think, uh, I strongly believe that the, the first place this kind of stuff will take hold is actually in the developing world, not in the developed world because money is pretty broken there and we're, we're just fairly well here. So like, like he's the same, like, things are gonna take off where they have the greatest need. So, um, but yeah, so I think that that's what's gonna happen. So given that, why do you think Bitcoin is not taking off in the underdeveloped world? Oh, because of because you basically have to buy in to Bitcoin. Like if you want to use Bitcoin, you have to shell out money. Whereas that, that's not how things grow on the internet. You, they just need to be free first, and then people, if they like them, then they can buy them. But also, and also the volatility. Well, even four six months ago, like how hard was it to get Bitcoin? Yeah. You had to really know how to get around the internet to set stuff up. I mean, still, it's, it's, it's getting better, but it's still pretty darn hard. Um, and... We're, we're working in communities where the digital divide is real, um, and we're starting to work in communities where we have to think about literacy. Right? How do we change our password system if people can't read? 
Um, what we're finding is that people can identify numbers far better than they can identify words, right? So that helps some of the pin security, but still it's a challenge, especially in communities where people give their SIM card to the agent and give them their password and say, please fill it up for me, right? How do we deal with that in a Bitcoin world? We need to think about these things. Yeah. Um, there's a huge, I was on a panel that was talking about financial inclusion, and there was not a single crypto person besides me. It was like Vodafone and uh, like the MSF folks and OBDR Foundation, and they, we were asked, um, why is financial inclusion becoming such a hot issue now? And they all said, it's actually not because of mobile. They're like, we're sick of hearing mobile is the answer. They say it's because people are finally learning about human-centric design in financial services. And like we're getting that our products have to match people's cultural behavior around money. And, and that's actually why one sentence is popular. Yes, so, you know, I have an observation and an example uh, and a challenge. I love challenges. Yeah. <laughs> the observation is I think you guys have built a really interesting infrastructure for credit, uh, especially the fact that anybody can issue uh, credit, and that's really interesting. Um, and then a good example of that would be if I'm in one of these underdeveloped countries and I would like to borrow money to buy an animal like a cow, right? And right now there's no way for me to borrow, right? Or, or, or any way for people to lend me, right? So, but if I can create my own currency, I could issue that. Maybe I issue 10 hours of labor or maybe 50 gallons of milk on this cow that you're going to lend me money to go buy, and then I pay back over time. Uh, so building infrastructure for, for credit seems very powerful. Uh, and then the challenge is, if you're going to have an infrastructure for credit, because this is a credit infrastructure that you're building, you have to have a reputation network, which is what he was bringing up earlier. And so my challenge would be, uh, maybe spend a little bit of time thinking about how you're going to make credit uh, a piece of this infrastructure that you're building. Because I can't lend you money to buy that cow. It basically extend you financial services, which is what the third world is needing, unless I have some way to track your reputation over time. So it's something that we're actually doing at MDA, which is our data scientist here, is, is you know, one of the people that's been working on that project. The idea is that we need to make all the data that's available, um, one, you know, private enough that people's identity is as visible as they want it to be, but not more than that. What data needs to be in there so that people can start building credit scores? What APIs do we need? What type of data flow so that people can start building business models off of this? Um, how do you credit score people is a very, very hard problem especially when people have no digital footprint, right? So, so it is something that we think needs to happen. Um, we think that the hooks for that need to be in the system, like the inputs and outputs, but the actual businesses should, should be built by people besides us, because our goal is that we shouldn't be the ones building the, down to the consumer level. We want to stay as neutral as possible. We don't want to be competitive with anybody that's actually offering the core financial services direct to the consumer, and then this is actually one of them. Um, I think that's huge, a huge opportunity for, for business people in the market. Um, okay. Like from a data perspective, like I don't know what a farmer can actually say. Like that's a good leader, right? Versus like you know uh, someone who like runs a small business in Malaysia. Like I don't like that's way too much data. So like we trust like my like the farmer in Kenya might trust that microfinance or that from Kenya who knows like landscape. And so like or like you know. Uh, I, you know, there's a bank, a lending bank in Malaysia that like knows how small an like, entrepreneur's network works. So we can say that trust possible while trusting in these like nonprofits and organizations to like do that, to like do some reputation for us. You could also allow those users to set up their own trust networks. Uh, but like, I mean, from the data perspective, like, like how do you like? It's just like way too much data, right? And then it becomes a human like. I can store all my transactions locally. And then I can share them with people yeah. who are in my network. But, but somebody can build it on top of it and then decide what they want to. Like somebody can offer that as a service and like create an open source system where you're like, here's a way to store the data, and then the communities can then decide what data points are important to us. Yeah. Right? And, and who should be the person that should like should all votes be equal or should certain like local elders have a greater vote? Like all those little details should it would be awesome if somebody could build an like, open source solution that kind of sits on top of something that anybody can use. Was it you that asked the question earlier about local currencies as well? Yeah. Yeah, like all of that does tie together. I went to school in New York, which is the most famous for the hour. Well, it's changed a lot of things. The holds is really, is really awesome. Is that the Statue of Liberty Yeah. But we have Ithaca Hours there. And no. Ithaca Hours is a local currency where you work for an hour and you get this Ithaca Hour, you take it to the local co-ops, 
and then you know you can buy things with it. Um, I think that there's ample rooms and things like that to be built on top of, of Stellar as well. Um, money is really local, and what we should do as a foundation is build our core protocol to be as flexible as possible so that people can dream up all these amazing things that fit their context. Um, and credit, we should have the data outputs that anybody can crunch onto that they need to build their models. Um, and that, that, that would be actually a huge improvement because today our credit scores are only by like three companies. <coughs> yeah, it should be more than that. If you ask me to build a reputation score, I will build it with someone who like, lives in San Francisco and like has always been in the bank once in a while. And I will fuck up like many times from like, oh yeah, this farmer in Kenya is like not like you know, treated well with my reputation score versus like if you go to someone in Kenya who understands what it's like, you say but you like you you don't like unfairly malign someone. Like and we like you know when you have a bad credit score and it's not like not your fault, like it reflects on your life and it hurts your life. So it's safer to like yeah, a lot of people who know the local economy to do it. To that point, I think that Stellar is particularly well suited for this. As I mentioned, right, like Bitcoin is, <coughs> we talked about like where it's not, not the identity aspects of it, right? Where it's a new address for each transaction you're doing. Whereas in Stellar, it's one address, one account for one person. You can really build up a history that way. And where people may value anonymity, some people may value being known and being known to have. Uh, being able to be known to pay their bills on time or things of this nature. And I feel like that, that data is actually a lot more tangible in, in a, a Stellar like model. You can do it within blockchain systems, you can sign it by the keys of all the crap in the past transactions. But you're right, having Stellar is uniquely positioned for credit. Sure. Yeah, I'm not trying to compare it. What is this with that? You got enough to do, Sandra? You're good? I mean, I could go all night. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Andrew.